Hi, everyone. Welcome to another complimentary Green Tech Media webinar. Today's webinar is part of a series of webinars that we do throughout the year to help keep professionals in the solar, energy storage, and grid modernization market informed through research and analysis on the latest technologies and market trends. So today's presentation is called Strategies in Climate Risk Mitigation, Keeping the Power On with Advanced Solar Software, and is brought to you by Next Tracker, the leading global solar tracker provider. I'm Molly Cox. I'm an analyst on the solar team here at Wood McKenzie, and I'll be moderating today's discussion. So if you enjoy this webinar, I do want to remind you we have an upcoming Green Tech Media event. Um, Grid Edge Innovation Summit will be starting November 30th, so highly encourage folks to sign up. It's a great way to take a deeper dive into the industry and network with key decision makers, um, so, so definitely encourage that. And before we get started, I just want to take a moment and go over the screen in front of you. So the speaker biographies are accessible from the top tabs by clicking on each of the speaker's names, and you can use the link on the left-hand side of your screen to download a copy of the slides from today's webinar. Most importantly, the Q&A module is on the left side of your screen, so please use this throughout the presentation. Submit your questions for our speakers, and we'll have about a 10-15 minute Q&A session at the end of the presentation. So today, it's my honor to introduce our speakers. We'll be hearing from Alex Rodell from Next Tracker, Michael Collidner at Marsh, and Sharif Kadir at RETC. They'll be sharing perspectives and findings um, when it comes to climate threats to utility scale solar and how the implementation of software can help. So this webinar will definitely serve to be beneficial for many types of entities, from solar developers, EPCs, underwriters, manufacturers, and more. But just to start things off, I do want to give a brief overview of what Wood McKenzie is seeing in the global tracker landscape. And later on, I'll just hone in briefly on some utility scale system cost trends. But as you can see, you know, North America will lead the tracker installation market globally from 2020 to 2025, as most utility scale applications in this region are constructed with trackers. And it's also important to note, though, that smaller sites, such as five megawatts or less, are increasingly considering trackers. And the utility scale market in the U.S. is forecasted to have very strong growth through 2025. So this would be um, the primary contributor to North America's leading position. And WoodMac has also seen that more difficult sites with complex terrain that previously favored fixed tilt are actually now being developed with trackers. And this is especially true as tracker vendors enhance their products to be more flexible for uneven terrain or locations with rocky soil, for example. And then zooming out of the, the U.S. for a little bit, the utility scale market across the globe, um, you see that actually the, the big bifacial module markets, such as North America, Middle East, and Latin America, are also the biggest tracker markets. And this isn't necessarily shocking as you know, bifacial modules are commonly paired with trackers to maximize energy production. Um, but I do want to point that out. And here you can see that, you know, although trackers will only account for 40% of the global ground market in 2025, um, tracker market value will consistently surpass fixed tilt starting this year in 2020 and will continue to do so over the next five years, as you can see here. So moving on to the touch on the discussion around system costs, you know, tracker applications can, can increase the total CapEx as the applications alone can be about 20 to 50% more than a fixed tail application or even higher sometimes. Uh, but we can expect that tracker prices will continue to decline, to, to continue to decline on a dollar per watt basis, driven by increases in module power density. And of course, there are other considerations um, for design and engineering when we think about the newer, larger wafer and physically larger modules with higher power class. But just to focus on the U.S. utility scale market, Wood McKenzie estimates average 50 megawatt system cost in 2020 will be about 99 cents per watt DC, assuming bifacial modules and single axis road trackers. And to note, the bifacial module prices in this chart do include Section 201 tariffs on imported bifacial modules into the U.S., and it does not assume any tariff extension or increased scenario of those tariffs. 
So with that, I'll go ahead and pass it on to Michael. Thanks, Molly. Uh, really excited to be here today and um, really excited uh, to see the increase in the maturity in the, in the space, uh, particularly over the last uh, year and a half. Um, this is a really challenging time for those that are uh, trying to think about the cost of risk management, uh, which would include the cost of insurance on these projects. Um, but I, I think the investments that are being made in risk mitigation today uh, are really a demonstration of the level of maturity that we're seeing. I'm going to go ahead and on this first slide just introduce a little bit about uh, Marsh. Uh, Marsh is one of several companies within the Marsh and McLennan Company's family. Uh, Marsha McLennan is the global leader in risk strategy and people. From a risk advisory and insurance brokerage standpoint, which is really where Marsh fits into this, um, we are the largest integrated uh, renewable energy brokerage team uh, globally. Um, we are unique in that uh, we serve clients around the world, and we actually serve clients uh, in a number of different um, uh, uh, positions, including original equipment manufacturers, EPC contractors, developers, owners, uh, et cetera. So really uh, broad, broad base. Um, what I'd like to do now is actually spend a little bit of time setting the stage for what's going to follow here and, and really stress the importance of why is insurance uh, becoming such a topic today uh, in, the, in the renewable energy project development space? And, and you know, this graphic really tells the story. Marsh uh, puts out an index uh, quarterly, which just looks at overall what's happening in the marketplace with respect to the cost of property insurance uh, and casualty insurance associated with uh, our clients' placements. And, you know, while this uh, index is, is a U.S.-focused property index, um, for those of you in the renewable energy space who have some familiarity with recent um, uh, renewals for your programs, you, you know, you may be aware that, in fact, depending on where you choose to lo uh, locate your project and what size project you have, uh, including what technology you've chosen, you may be on par with this or you may be multiples of what you see here. Um, there's a lot of factors that go into the price of insurance. Uh, it's not set arbitrarily. And what we're going to focus on today is really putting the catastrophic risk component uh, in context. When we talk about catastrophic risk from an underwriting standpoint, I can tell you uh, as, a, as a former underwriter of essentially the very low frequency, high severity uh, risk, which is what catastrophic risk ultimately is, um, it's probably the most difficult component um, within the underwriting process to, to really get right. And there's a number of factors that go into that, but one of the single biggest out there is frankly, um, you know, there's very little activity. It's very difficult. Uh, for an underwriter to monitor uh, and stay disciplined uh, with respect to pricing around catastrophic risk. And the models that we have um, are also quite limited. Uh, with the absence of data points, it becomes really difficult to have high confidence projections around which to build uh, your estimates. As a result, it can be um, probably one of the uh, most challenging areas uh, to underwrite. What we've shown on the right here is just an example of why it's so important to get it right. And I don't want to dwell on the numbers so much as, as provide a little bit of a background on the, on the stories that it would tell. In, in this case, we've shown three hypothetical portfolios, all of comparable size and premium volume, all achieving what I would characterize as industry standard results uh, over a 20-year period. Uh, we've used publicly available information for the property casualty industry more uh, broadly. And so this is a credible example of what a typical return might look like uh, for essentially an average property casualty underwriter. What we've also done uh, is taken the liberty of injecting a relatively large catastrophic loss commensurate with one seen recently uh, in the solar space um, and having that play out on two different portfolios. In the one case, the portfolio uh, has to make a decision um, and, and declines to make any adjustments uh, to premiums, essentially looks at it as an aberration, and that's the aberration, and that's the red line you see at the bottom. In the other case, uh, the underwriter has to uh, make some adjustments in order to bring the portfolio back into performance uh, with the uh, with the baseline. Uh, and in that case, you see premium increases, uh, essentially averaging in excess of 20% for multiple years. Um, this is not unlike the case that has played out within 
the renewable energy space uh, in the United States. Um, and it is not unlike uh, what's also being experienced in other areas of the insurance market. Catastrophic risk ultimately um, goes really well until something goes wrong, uh, and then capital has to correct. Um, the reality is uh, if the discussion is between whether the capital providers are ultimately going to fund this loss um, and, and pay for that, or whether uh, we as industry will see it in the cost of our premiums, I think we know the answer there. And part of the challenge here is that we need a stable, long-term, uh, and sustainable uh, approach to financing risk. And you can see how the, uh, the market forces and the magnitude of catastrophic risk can really make that a challenge. So now that we've kind of got a sense of just how material catastrophic risk can be, how do we find upside in support of projects where it can't be avoided? Um, the reality is it really does start with selection of location. So individual uh, project sites, when you first look at where a particular lease or opportunity might arise, uh, really understanding that each location brings with it its own unique natural hazard risk profile is absolutely critical. And so choosing that location and at least being aware of whether or not you have that exposure uh, is really the first and most important uh, piece. The second comment we'd make is that, you know, materials and systems really do matter. Um, what you choose to do given the exposure that your project faces uh, ultimately does play out over the life of the project. For example, if you decide that you're going to put a project in a catastrophically exposed area and take no mitigating action, you have to ask yourself how your project is going to look relative to other projects in the same location that, that may have invested uh, in risk mitigation. Ultimately, funding catastrophic risk with insurance um, is limited by the amount of supply and the risk appetite of those that are willing to fund it. The best projects will differentiate themselves. The other thing I think that we've got to do is challenge perceptions of what's possible. So given the exposures that you have and the investments that you've made, how, how articulate is, is an individual project in, in presenting its unique exposures and the mitigating actions that have been taken to the marketplace. There's a lot of different modeling that can be done. You'll hear some of that uh, later. Um, but also thinking about how programs are structured, how many individual counterparties you put on the program, how sustainable those partners are over time, um, what types of specialty insurance solutions may be used when you can't quite use the traditional property or casualty uh, solutions that exist, and ultimately how you get the right balance of commercial and mutual partnerships all really determines what's possible, not what was possible yesterday. Uh, and in this marketplace today, um, we see that the importance of what we'll call risk management maturity uh, has really never presented a greater opportunity cost uh, for failing to mature. So how big is the cost of failing to mature? Um, there's a lot of different factors that go into how to price risk. It's not a commodity. Uh, these projects are all unique. Uh, they all have unique attributes. They have different stages of life, uh, different uh, values associated um, with those power purchase agreements, um, maybe in different markets. Ultimately, when we look at it, though, in our database, there's a huge difference between what we characterize the midpoint or average and the fourth quartile project. So what is a fourth quartile project? A fourth quartile project may be cat exposed. It may also be, frankly, uh, expressing a very low level of risk management maturity. Maybe there wasn't much thought that went into risk mitigation at all. Um, fourth quartile projects may also be in extreme areas uh, where, frankly, there's very little ability for underwriters uh, to really diversify their exposure or build an appropriate portfolio. There's a lot of different factors that go into it. But what we've shown here is an example of a relatively modest project uh, a 100, uh, 100 megawatt solar project in the U.S. And sorting through our database, what we're able to determine is ultimately the value for the project over a 15-year life, uh, the difference in the net present value, the impact of the cost of insurance alone um, can, can vary by a factor of 10. And maturity uh, about how that risk is managed, as well as the actual cat exposure, are probably the two single biggest drivers. So there's a huge difference ultimately in the cost of insurance and it can very materially impact the value of the project. Um, one of the most important things that we're uh, talking to clients about today is how do we improve the maturity of risk management for a rapidly maturing industry? And frankly, the, the costs of failing to do so today have never been higher. 
And with that, I'll turn it over to Sharif. Thank you, Michael. Um, great information. Hi, everybody. So um, just a, um, a quick set of slides discussing some of the work that we did as it relates to assessing the risk of modules being installed in high-risk environments. Um, you know, um, and so just a little bit about the, the company. We've been around since 2009. We introduced the first uh, consolidated uh, bankability um, a program as it relates to the durability of modules. Um, and we received various accreditations throughout the year and we've been supporting the industry since then, both in terms of certification and in terms of facilitating and um, help understand the risk associated with various products uh, being fielded in, in various projects out there. So just a little bit about background about um, the type of testing that we did and why it's important to talk about right now. And so as most people are aware of and given a lot of the information that's been um, available from the, in the industry right now, modules are getting larger for a variety of different reasons. Um, if you look at historical um, cell efficiency trends, you know, in, you know, if you look at um, for the past decade or two, it's always been a power um, you know, a power race, right? You know, how high, uh, how much power can you get out of a particular module? And that has a direct impact on cost, obviously, the cost of developing a project. Um, the, higher the, the, the higher the power a module can produce, the less land you, you need to use, the less, um, you know, um, uh, materials, trackers, inverters, et cetera, et cetera, that, that you need to deploy. And so if, if you look at the efficiency developments over, over the past uh, decade or two, um, the maximum theoretical efficiency of a cell reached about 25%, sometimes in the mid to late 90s. Um, and right now we're at about 25.8%. So there hasn't been really drastic increases in, in the efficiency of these cells. What has changed recently um, and why modules have been getting, uh, have been producing more power is the manufacturing process of those cells has improved and has gotten better um, and, and has gotten closer to the theoretical maximum. And, and those, those improvements are starting to stagnate. There aren't huge improvements in manufacturing processes that can make a module produce 10% more energy. So the next phase of improvements has been in increasing the area of the cell to be able to collect more light from the sun and generate more power. Um, and these are, these, are, these are trends that were published uh, by NREL and by a few institutions out there. Um, and you can see right now the development of the cells ranging from, um, you know, from what, what, what's known as the M2, which are the smaller cells that everybody's been used to for the past 10 years, to the new cells, the M12, 210 mm size, um, that have been lead, uh, driving the, uh, the, the large module formats. Um, the industry has been collectively pushing for this. As you can imagine, as a module increases in, in size and power, produces more power, and that power is what module manufacturers sell, and that's why you hear the dollar per watt um, numbers. So these, these are the, the module manufacturers that introduced large size modules um, this year, um, this, this article has been published um, by various uh, news agencies and research institutions. And you can see that, you know, the majority of the module manufacturers that, that you're used to hearing um, either have large modules with high power in their pipeline um, or are working on some. Now, as these modules increase in size, they increase in weight. And that presents a challenge in the industry. Um, most of these modules predominantly are installed by, by physical labor. Um, we don't have robots you know, going out there and, and installing a million modules, we deploy uh, people. And, and the more people are that are required to install these modules, as the modules get heavier, the, the, the costlier the, the project becomes. And so, so the module manufacturers have been under pressure to reduce the weight um, of those modules. And, and so as the, the main thing that the module manufacturers have have been doing to reduce the weight is by reducing the thickness of the glass. And as the glass um, thickness goes down, oh, I'm sorry, um, I think I'm having some, I don't know, the, okay. 
there's been some okay I'm sorry so as the glass thickness has been has has um, has decreased um, it it has the modules have been um, have been showing some weaknesses in um, um, I'm, I'm sorry um, Molly I think there there's been an issue with the with the slides they've been jumping around okay that seems to be have stopped okay I apologize everybody so as the as the modules have increased have increased in size and the glass thickness have has decreased um, modules have become more flexible and they've been they've been showing some um, some weaknesses in their me mechanical integrity and what racking and tracker manufacturers have done is is compensate for those weaknesses by introducing um, better stronger um, uh, racking systems and clamping systems and rails um, to to ensure the modules do not fail um, in the projects um, and so this has been something that that's been dealt with but why is hail important right now well it's important because there has been a trend um, an increasing trend of introducing large mod large installations in in hail prone regions um, and that presents that presents a unique uh, challenge for the industry so what we've done is we have um, undertaken several projects and we've been doing this for many years uh, performing hail testing on on modules but what has been really interesting is the rate of failure that we see associated with hail in the lab and this is not specifically in the field um, has increased um, substantially so modules used to be um, you know uh, they used to use four millimeter glass 3.2 millimeter glass and and passing um, the standard hail test requirements was was a non-issue. That is not the case nowadays. And so, one of the um, what we did is, as we worked with the industry um, to um, you know to assess the risks associated with this, we it was evident that the industry lacked guidance in terms of how to properly assess and evaluate the risk associated with some of these technologies. And so we introduced the hail durability test program. And essentially, in, in a nutshell, what the program does is it creates a, um, um, a clear image on how the modules are going to behave under certain conditions in certain regions. Um, you can just imagine um, you know, us performing a, 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 ver a variety of tests on, on these modules. Um, and assessing their likelihood of passing or failing certain um, hail impacts. And then the downstream stakeholders would take that information and figure out and, and match those modules with, uh, with specific projects. So as we did this and we worked with, uh, with, with um, the downstream uh, folks like um, Marsh and, and the underwriters, um, it was clear for from their perspective that this was really important. For one thing is there's really no standard requirement in the industry that says modules have to pass a, a specific hail impact. Um, the standardization in um, market, you know, all the IEC standards, they do have um, a lot of uh, different hail impact requirements, but you only need to pass a one inch hail impact in order in order to uh, receive your certificate and so and that's what most modular manufacturers do and so uh, providing um, a, a higher level of, of, of uh, uh, a test or adherence to a higher level of, of hail impact has been really important um, and has been received very well by the by the uh, uh, by the developers and, and the insurance industry so going forward um, and looking forward, um, you know, I don't, I don't know if the module manufacturers are going to revert back to uh, increasing the size and the thickness, uh, I mean, the thickness of the, the glass to make them more robust. But what can be done is for the rest of the industry to compensate for that um, and to pick up the slack, much, much like um, what they have done in the case of the mechanical integrity of the modules when it came to wind and snow loading. And so what we've done is we've done an interesting project um, with Next Tracker to assess 
Um, the module's durability and ability to withstand severe hail impact under different conditions. And that, that, that was really um, uh, an interesting project in many ways. Um, and so what we, and the, the, the concept was really simple at the beginning, essentially uh, performing an, a direct um, impact on the module and then tilting the module to simulate a stow angle uh, by the tracker manufacturer, in this case, next tracker, and then just understanding how the module would react to the same impact. Um, and we expected um, higher resilience and higher durability of the module, but we didn't expect what we found, which is the modules being able to take 3x, 300% impact energy before they broke um, when they're in the stow feature. And that was really, really interesting, and we thought that was a very critical finding for the industry to be able to continue to install these modules in hail prone regions. And I'll pass, the, I'll pass it to Alex to uh, discuss a little bit more. Yeah, great. Thank you, Sharif. Um, I just want to comment what Sharif is talking about is so important because that's what's happening right now. It's so current. But let's take a second and talk about the future, right? We look at next tracker's assets and, and why this is so important to us and why there's so many dedicated resources to it is because we're at 40 gigawatts right now of, of a market cap and that's going to keep going up there was actually this this really incredible report uh released by the international energy agency listing solar as now the cheapest form worldwide okay and so when you look at this and you think about the future as so many people are on right now from, from asset management side and insurance side, having a portfolio of 50 gigawatts, 100 gigawatts, 200 gigawatts is very much possible for us, right? We look at everything going up and to the right. So when you think about deploying this associated with risk, there also has to be a risk of scale, right? That risk of scale means if 1% breakage happens, that full monetary value is gonna be so large. And managing that risk is, is also super key, right? We want to make sure that we don't have to have boots on the ground at all times because once we hit 2030 and 2040, there's just going to be too many projects to, to manage, right? And so when we look at that different risk profile, this is coming straight from the insurance agency, right? Coming straight from GQ right here. This is, this is a great quote. It says, investing in trackers and other equipment that can react in real time to changing weather conditions such as wind speed, can help protect these assets from damage. That's what's key, right? Uh, we want to be able to protect these assets because all this extreme weather we see is just getting more and more prominent. We, we all see it. The hurricane season this year, as, as we've all seen, just, just keeps going up. Down around Texas, Louisiana, we've seen 700-year wind speed. So obviously extreme weather is becoming more prominent. And why extreme weather is becoming uh, such a big topic of discussion is, as Michael so you know well put at the beginning of this, it's really accounting for, for not a, the, the largest amount of claims overall, but from a dollar value, what's actually hitting our pocketbook, this is what the insurance industry is reacting to. And you see just in, in Michael's trends, really great chart, it keeps going up and to the right. And, and that's why this piece of the pie that, that you see up and to the right here of this pie chart is saying that, hey, these catastrophic damages are counting for 80% of the claims. And, and so that's why there's, there's such a focus on it. And so when we look at those, those different claims, just like most things we see, our industry keeps getting more complex, right? Before, we only used to think about wind. But now we're thinking about all these multitude of reasons. We think about wind, we think about snow, we think about flood, we think about hurricane, and most recently, we think about hail, right? And then it, it's, it's not just as simple as looking at one of these at a time, right? We think about what is the possibility of multiple events occurring at the same time and how do we manage that? And, and the best way to manage that really is, is to have smart built in, okay? So we think about smart, what, what, what does smart mean? Just like every industry, you know, big tech is taking over, big data is taking over. And really, the tracker industry has been slow to this until recently. So as we talked about before with, with the size of our fleet, why there's so much dedication to it, and why we've Next Tracker's really developed in software, right, is, is to think about all these different smart controls. And as GQ noted, 
having those different smart controls can reduce your risk. So how are we doing that? The first of which is wireless communication, as, as you can see in point one. The second of which is firmware updates. And this is one that, that is really amazing. Just like you can update your phone, right, you get push firmware to it, you can update the tracker system. So what's incredible for us is of those uh, solar trackers that were installed in 2016, 2017, 2018, where the industry thought that hail wasn't a risk, we're actually able to push firmware retroactively. And that has just been such a huge value add to it, right? And then thinking forward is, as we talked about you know, in these charts, where are we going to be at in, in 2030? Where are we going to be at in 2040? I honestly don't know what risks might arise over time. Ex extreme weather keeps getting to it. So meaning what you install today, you, might, you don't have to be stuck with in the future. If a new risk platform shows up in 2030, we can push that firmware to it, which, which is just amazing. And then third is the smart panel. The smart panel is going to be the next wave of innovation. And I cannot wait to introduce what next is going to be doing with this, this smart panel in the coming months. So, so stay tuned for that. And so when we think about this, right, why, why is hail such a big discussion these days? We look at this map. It's, it's essentially the same map Sharif showed. And when we look at, you know, the, what's been released from, from Wood McKenzie recently is how prominent Texas is, how prominent these southeast states are. Uh, which is fantastic for solar, difficult for risk, difficult for insurance, right? Really pay attention to Texas. Texas is going to be a, such a hot market over these next couple of years. And you look at this, this center profile. It, it's called Hail Alley. And so what's, what's actually happening in Hail Alley? So what, what you can't see there is actually the elevation um, increases dramatically on the right side as you go west as you go towards, you know, think about Colorado as, as you're right, rising up. And then secondly, if you also look at thunderstorms, you have early season thunderstorms happening in the springtime in these portions. And the thunderstorms start to happen later and later um, as you go east. So, so Florida has a prominent August thunderstorm. So why does that matter? That matters because how you produce hail is through cold thunderstorms. So when you look at that section of Texas, which is obviously super hot, uh, for, hot for solar, but it, it produces cold air, one through elevation, two through spring thunderstorms, okay? And then that's what produces that catastrophic hail. So when you think about if you want to set up these, these assets, NX Navigator, which we'll talk about in a moment, you really want to set yourself up for spring. If, if you're not having a hail mitigation software put in, before May, I would say you have a very high risk asset portfolio. And so let's talk about what is happening. As, as Sharif you know, sort of noted here, um, hail is becoming a, a big deal. You know, this, uh, as reported by Insurance Insider, this Midway project received so much industry discussion point because unfortunately it hit 70 to $80 million. This is, this is what we're trying to avoid. And just as discussed previously, this happened in May, as, re as re reported by them. So very much within that very high-risk portfolio of North Texas, as well as sort of large hailstones. Now, we also look at this chart at, at, the, at the bottom left. Just like everything, the hail occurrences, the large size hail especially, is increasing in prominence. So what that means is uh, that the, the solar installed today is going to be at a higher risk tomorrow. And what's happening right there, as, as Sharif noted, is the modules aren't getting stronger, right? They're just getting bigger. And they're actually even getting sort of cheaper in a way. They're getting thinner glass, right? And so as we look to 2030, as we look to the race to the bottom, our panels become more and more vulnerable and all the more reason to have software set up to, to, to reduce this risk. Okay, so now let's look at how to prevent that, right? We've, we've really combined um, with a lot of really good consultants. One of those consultants is, is Allen Weather Risk, okay? And what we tried to do is now we're mapping hail size and wind speed. And this is, this is really key, right? Because in order to detect certain things, you have to look at what, what the risk is. What you're essentially seeing is the lower uh, size hail are produced at, at higher wind speeds, okay? 
And that's typically because, think about it, if it's going faster, that, that hail is going to melt. And then secondly, when, when you have smaller hail, it has a tendency to be thrown sort of at an angle or, or sideways. And based on that, it has more time in the air to, 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 to melt. And now let's look to the right of the chart, that really, really damaging hail, right? Happening at, at about like three inches or greater, that's definitely going to cause damage. And what you're really going to notice there is, is the wind speeds associated with that. And what's, what that means is that hail is going to fall sort of straight down towards Earth, and it's going to be very large. So if you're tracking at solar noon in that scenario, you're going to be at a very, very vulnerable position and potentially have breakage like the last project you saw. So meaning without this software, right, we could be in a vulnerable position throughout the day. With uh, the advanced systems that are coming with two, next track Next Tracker has combined with a lot of warning systems. Uh, we, we can see one right here on this, this bottom left. You can have uh, a reaction time now probably about 15 to 10 minutes beforehand, and it's very important once you get that hail warning to react, right? And so why do we want to react, and what do we want to do? What we really want to do is get to that high stow scenario because that gets away from that impact angle. Uh, and what we're going to see is, in this video coming up, is why angle matters. And Sharif, after that, is going to describe the, the test that they did at RETC and why angle matters. So as you're seeing right now, essentially what's happening here is the direct impact using the same projectile, which is a two-inch uh, projectile, uh, both at direct impact and at a stow angle. And you will see that the direct impact, the module just gets destroyed, right? And that's what you see. These are the typical uh, photos you see in the field, whereas the stow angle, the module, just, just nothing happens to it. The cells don't even crack. And so this has been... Um, uh, an eye-opener for us and for the industry. Okay, great. So, now let's, let's talk about the software side, right? Uh, let's walk through, okay, I get a hail warning now. Uh, what, is, what should I do? What's going to happen? What, you, what we've introduced now is it's called NX Navigator. You have a clear dashboard that owners, asset managers, and Next Tracker to, can use to go to that high angle of stow in the event of a hail warning, right? So when you're thinking about these, these different people on the phone, I see Alabama Power is here. I see other people from the southeast in those particular regions. As you get towards the spring and summer in that thunderstorm and hail season, you really want to have this set up. And what this does is, with one button activation, we can get movement to a tracker within one minute. And we can do that remotely. And doing it remotely is, is so key, right? Because right now we live in a COVID world. We can't just send people to site overnight that easily anymore. And then when you think about it again for the future, how do we have boots on the ground for 50 to 100 to 200 gigawatts worth of solar? Doing it remotely is the best way to protect your asset. And, that, and that's what's so key. And so with that click of a button after the hail warning system, we go to that 60 degrees and we see that we can really protect the most important part of our system, which is what? The module. So now let's also think about what else can we do to protect the module, right? A big thing happening in, in you know, this, this high risk profile zones of the southeast in Texas and in Florida is floods, okay? What you're going to see is, I love this kayak guy. I don't know if you guys can see within this, this photo on the right here. Uh, this guy is, is, is literally sort of kayaking next to our trackers. But what do you see right there, right? Uh, you see the equipment elevated, okay? And then what you also see is, is you see certain trackers in that flood stow, and then you see other ones in the distance still operating. So that's what goes back to the beginning of our conversation is what is a smart tracker, right? A smart tracker is analyzing the different zones that you need to protect and still produce power in the other ones. Obviously, on the hillside in the background, 
those ones can keep tracking. And that way we can lower costs with respect to peer heights and tracker heights and still get out of risk. And, and so that's really helping your, your pocketbook as well on, on, the, on the front side when you install the project as well as long term as you carry those, those assets owner. And then secondly, as, as much talked about is wind, right? And we've talked a lot about wind. Uh, but as Sharif duly noted, what is happening in the industry today? We're seeing that modules are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And this absolutely has an effect on trackers. And so we've seen over and over again, as, as you see in this scenario, Next Tracker installed one phase in Australia, okay? And then a uh, competitor installed the second phase. And you see the same storm, but different results. Just like hail, you might see the same storm, but different results. And that's why choosing your, your vendor selection up front is, is so key, okay? And David Banks is, is seeing this, this change uh, as well. He's seen it, you know, David Banks is, is present at CPP. He's, he's done so much for the industry right now. He's introduced, you know, dynamic measures. But, but what he's also seen is what we're all seeing, right? We're seeing a race to the bottom. Just like modules, as Sharif duly noted, as modules are doing that race to the bottom, so are tracker manufacturers. And we're also seeing an influx of, of new players within the market. And unfortunately, what we've seen as well is some of those new players in the market have seen some of their own sort of wind failures, okay? So a lot of these things, as if you're an owner, you want to make sure you have the correct wind tunnel test up, up front, right? And, and what are those, those wind tunnel tests? I think the first thing is, are your wind tunnel tests covering those new large format modules, right? A lot of those wind tunnel tests initially done, you know, like for example, Next Tracker, back in 2015, they're on that one meter by two meter form factor. And now you see a push for what? Three strings, four strings. We see going up to almost a 2.4 meter length. We see huge up to 1.3 meter width. So what is that encompassing, okay? Um, and then we also see is the amount of wind speeds that's gonna affect those systems, uh, the lower wind speeds are gonna produce those catastrophic failures that unfortunately we've seen in the past, right? So you have this, this lower, this, this higher risk profile because lower wind speeds obviously are more common. Now, as an owner, if you're here, uh, you should also say, what are your second and third dynamic modes? Because now, what previously would take, say, 110 to 130 miles per hour, per hour to put those second dynamic modes, we're now seeing at 70 and 80 miles per hour. So I'm predicting, really, the market is going to have another adjustment. We're going to see when these new modules get installed and as these storm seasons go through, unfortunately, there's going to be a lot of people who learn the hard way who don't have the proper wind tunnel testing in, in flux. So let's, let's wrap all that together, right? Because obviously this is a complex topic. Um, there's a lot of factors. There's, there's wind, there's flood, there's snow, there's hail. All these things matter. And without being connected to your system, you're not going to be able to have that immediate feedback. You're not going to know what the help is. The old way to do it, the archaic way to do it, is to sort of look at your inverter data. Say, oh, something looks like it's down. But now we can see it in, in real time, right? Because all of us, whether you're in the module industry, whether you're an asset owner, whether you're an insurance provider, all of us right now are in the in the business of producing power. We all want solar power to continue to be that leading form of energy, you know, especially over these next couple of years. So when you think about this, big data, big tech, big software, they're all here to help us. And if you want a connected system and you want to be connected to the future, you need to have this sort of smart tracking system. Otherwise, you're, you're showing yourself you're going to be vulnerable. You're going to hit the pocketbook when you don't want it. There's a reason why insurance rates are on the rise, as, as, as Michael shows, is because we aren't connected to our systems. And the more we can be connected, the more we can share data, the more we can assess these risks and react in real time, the better the industry is going to be as a whole. So with that, I, I thank everyone for, for joining. Uh, such good insight. I, I mean, Molly shows how much the market is increasing. Um, you know, Michael was talking about how much insurance costs are increasing, unfortunately, and, you know, Sharif really noting 
how modules are changing, affecting all of us, right? And so there's a lot of follow-up uh, to this because this is we get so much feedback. Um, we have white papers from Next Tracker, including the one that, that started this webinar on extreme weather risk, as well as our, our wind white paper. And then Marsh and RATC have produced also forms on themselves. There's one on natural catastrophes that, that talks about sort of insurance risk. Um, there's other ones around hailstorms, which of course has been such a big topic recently, and then overall risk management maturity. So I encourage you guys to start reading up because it's going to continue to be a conversation for the next several years. Thank you. Great. Alex and, and everyone, thank you so much for the, the great presentation to Michael and Sharif as well. Um, this is a lot of great information. We have some awesome questions coming in and just want to remind everyone, feel free to just keep submitting questions. We have about 15 minutes for Q&A. So Alex, just to follow up, you know, we have some questions around the, the testing that was done. We have one question here from the audience. Does the 60 degree stow angle increase wind loading? For example, during extreme weather or high winds, does that require additional engineering thought? Mm, that's a great question. I think it does increase wind loading from a static perspective, right? That is for, for certain. But it will decrease it from a dynamic perspective. And the reason being with associated with, with next tracker systems, and you see some other of our competitor system is a high angle stow beats low with respect to dynamics. Um, so if you think about it logically and you think about, uh, you know, sort of a sail going over and having more exposure to that wind, it, it does seem like that. But really, we, we think about it, what, what, what Michael talked about, and that's risk, right? And the real risk that we're seeing, why these catastrophic failures are happening, are because of dynamics. And so when we put ourselves at a 60 degree position, we prevent those dynamics. So that really helps us with respect to hail and wind because we're in the best position for both. That's great. Thank you so much. And just a quick follow-up question for you, Alex. Um, you know, in, in some of the testing and just seeing what, what could happen on site, you know, you see, you know, some, pan, some solar modules are broken in hailstorms, but others right next to them will remain intact. If you could talk a little bit about what's going on there and why that might be, it would be great. Yeah, that's that's a good question. We get that a lot. Um, I think when you, when you think about glass, right, glass is a brittle material. And just like sort of you get a nick on your windshield, right, a, a sort of a rock hits it and then it propagates over time. And so the same thing is, is really happening with the glass on your, on your solar panel. You get one small crack, right, and then a smaller piece of hail hits it and a smaller piece of hail hits it and then all hell breaks loose. And so that's why getting to that high angle stow and preventing that initial crack is, is so key because if, if you don't react in time and that first initial crack hits, you, you're done, right? Um, and so that's why you sort of see is one may have had a, a large impact hail on, on that during that storm and then the one adjacent to it didn't. But as soon as that crack hits, that's when the, the solar panel is lost. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks so much for that explanation. And moving to, um, to the risk management side of things, and you know, Michael would like to pose this question to you from the audience. What are some of the attributes of a mature risk management program? Yeah, there's, a, you know, there's, there's no one attribute or, or set of attributes, but I think it really does boil down to whether an organization actually thinks uh, not just about risk in terms of insurance, but risk um, you know, as a, as a discipline, as something that can be managed as well as finance. And I think insurance is, um, and has been, um, you know, for, for some time, a critical component to how the industry efficiently accesses third party capital, not just for catastrophic risk, uh, but frankly, to finance the project, to ensure that, um, we, we introduce new forms of capital, uh, to the space to help us grow. And I think that's going to continue. But I think if, if that's where we stop, if all we think about in terms of risk and risk management is the cost of insurance, then we're essentially saying that we're, we're just price takers uh, in the marketplace and we're not actually sophisticated about how we think about it. So the more we can do to understand risk and risk management as a discipline, um, the more mature we are as, a, as an industry. Definitely, and Michael, a quick follow-up along the same vein. 
you know, are there other areas of catastrophic risk beyond just the natural hazards that we might reasonably need to consider as, as we develop projects? Another question from the audience. Definitely. I, I would say, you know, natural hazard risk is, you know, front and center. It's most critical for us right now. But as we think about uh, and I think Alex addressed this to some degree, you know, we don't know what the catastrophic risks of the future are going to be. And, and these catastrophic risks can present themselves in a lot of different ways. Uh, the low frequency component to this is what makes it so challenging. Past performance is just not going to be indicative of future results. And so we have to be mature. We have to look forward and we have to think about um, where we put these projects and, and what technologies um, we use. And we have to continue to push that envelope. Uh, otherwise, we will simply be caught off guard. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, great. And speaking of the, the components in particular, Sharif, this might be one for you. Are the PV module certification standards being updated to account for these issues mentioned in the, in the webinar, namely high winds, snow, and hail as the modules are getting larger? Yes, in, in a way, these, the certification, is, as I mentioned earlier, um, the certification um, always lags behind the industry uh, because usually the, the development cycle of these modules outpaces the certification and the compliance required by, by, the, uh, by the international standards. And so in this particular case, as it, when it comes to hail, the standard has always provided um, information to perform hail testing at higher impact energies. Um, however, there's no requirement by the certification standards that one module must pass um, you know, a three inch or a two inch hail uh, impact. Um, and so you just need to be able to pass one and, and, and that's it. And so in this case, I think the industry itself needs to react to this and, and require the due diligence necessary to ensure these modules are going to perform and are going to, going to um, withstand the, uh, the high impact in these regions, in these high uh, hail uh, uh, occurrence regions. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And Sharif, to follow up on that, you know, are you able to, to add any input as to how module manufacturers themselves might be responding to some of these issues that you see in the lab? Are they receptive to addressing them, you know, just given what you were saying with the, the lack of, you know, specific requirements when it comes to the, um, the standards? I think it really varies by, you know, from module manufacturer to module manufacturer because there are, you know, as, as Alex mentioned, there are real uh, pressures by the industry to reduce costs and, and, and to increase power. And those are two diametrically opposed directions that the module manufacturers are forced to, to undertake. On the one hand, you need to generate more power, you need to reduce the cost, you need to make the modules easier and lighter to handle. And, um, and on the other hand, they have to be durable and they have to withstand these high hail impacts. And so from that perspective, some module manufacturers are responding by, by keeping the front glass um, thicker, while others are just dealing with, with this reality of, of, of price and, and power pressures um, and, and just selling the modules as is. And so it's difficult to, to, to know where the module manufacturers are going to go from here. Um, but I think the, the, the insurance um, industry and the developers and um, are, are going to put the pressure on them to do something about it. Mm -hmm, definitely. Um, and, you know, I think we'll, we'll start to see you know, everyone kind of working together, but very true regarding the, the price pressure. You know, Alex, this, this is a question for you, I think, and should we feel free to chime in afterwards, but we have a question here. What about the small diameter hail in a severe thunderstorm? You know, with modules faced to the wind, it has been shown that the small diameter hail can cause just as much damage as the larger hail. Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely right. You know, um, when you think about hail and how it causes damage, it's force, right? And, and what is that force going to be? You know, it's, it's going to be mass, right, times the, the speed that it hits it. So that small hail could really make an impact if it's, if it's very fast. Um, and where you really see that sort of, while the large diameter hail could be in, in North Texas, sort of as you go east to, to Alabama, Georgia, especially, you know, Florida doesn't really get hail, but as you go sort of east in those areas, 
that impact, that hail impact speed could really play a, a key role within it. Um, and so here, again, it's just, it's just this, the same thing. You want to get outside of that angle because of that impact. Um, and the best way to do that is, is remotely with the click of a button. So what we want to do too is it's not just monitoring if the hailstorm is, is coming, it's also monitoring wind direction. Um, and so when you, when you combine that, what's, what's great for us is our anemometers don't just sense um, overall wind speed, but it's also direction. So the owners can have all those decision-making tools in front of them in real time and click it you know, with, with one minute reaction time with a, with a button and make the right decision. If you have someone out on site, right, and, and you're trying to, to, to scramble around to, to rotate these trackers over manually, you're very likely going to make a potentially a wrong decision. And that's why remote access and connectivity can really empower the owners and asset managers and really help the insurers at the same time as well. Mm -hmm. Right, definitely, you know, the, that makes sense, the importance of the, the connectivity. And we actually have a question here about the, that, that small stick sensor. You know, how is that protected from the hail? You know, could it potentially break if, if hail were to, were to hit it? I'm sorry, Molly, what, what, what kind of sensor was that? So we have a question from the audience, just thinking about the, the sensors um, that, that you were discussing, you know, maybe the, it, it, the, the question says stick sensor, but if, feel free to comment on, you know, sure. if, if those themselves have protection, um, if, if yeah. yeah. Yeah, so, so right now we actually don't have any hail sensor. Um, right now it's done with different warning systems. And actually, Next Tracker has combined, which, which our customers are welcome to reach out to us for, on probably eight to 10 different weather prediction systems that we can, we can work with you guys on, hey, there's an extreme weather warning, whether it be hurricane, whether it be hail, whether it be you know, some sort of storm, even a snowstorm right there. So that way we can sort of get around it. We are working on further measures, and that's what some innovations that could potentially come from, from our smart panel on, but, but right now it's done strictly with weather warning systems and done, it with, done with our NX Navigator dashboard. Okay, great. Thank you for that clarification. And Michael, this, this one's for you, going back to the insurance discussion. Is it true that PV insurance companies can increase premiums in any given year based on a previous year's performance? So in short, I would say yes, and the, and the function is really depends on the type of insurer, the size of their portfolio, uh, how reliant they may be on um, other insurance companies to provide them uh, with the capacity needed to, to support their insured. So how, how dependent they are on reinsurance, um, essentially insurance for insurance companies. There's a number of different factors that go into it. I would say, um, you know, depending on the severity of the experience, Remember that insurers are, you know, in this, commercial insurers are in this to not only finance the risk, um, but get paid to do that. And if, if they can't do that, um, then yes, they're going to have to make adjustments. And the scale over which they make those adjustments um, depends on their individual business model. Um, some insurers, and one thing I think that's been a bright spot for a lot of, uh, a lot of our clients recently has been uh, the mutual insurance market which tends to have a longer time horizon and less of a profit motive. And so you can see over time less volatility in that pricing. Um, but again, there's pluses and minuses. It does not to suggest that commercial insurers or mutual insurers, one is better than the other. Um, a balanced approach and a, and a thoughtful and mature approach uh, is really what's going to drive the best result over time. Okay, that's great. I appreciate that. And, you know, one follow-up question for you, Michael, is, there ever a time when underwriters might actually be in a position to differentiate materially and directly on the basis of project design and technology selection? Definitely. And I think we've seen this in other industries, um, you know, and I know I've said it a bunch that this conversation around risk management maturity, um, you know, we tend to be very, we tend to put the blinders on and, and look only at what's kind of within our space. Um, but if we look to other industries in similar phases in their development cycle, what we see is that ultimately risk management and risk management maturity pays off over time. 
um, again, as the data, and I, and I, I love that example that, uh, that was shared with, with the two uh, different facilities right next to each other, the two different tracking systems. You know, in a world in which we've got more data over time, absolutely, those higher quality risks and the ones that ultimately can demonstrate that there's a difference between how they've mitigated the exposures and how another project has, that will make a difference. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, definitely. Um, thank you for that explanation. And, you know, we have a question here, um, you know, given everything that we've seen, especially with, you know, wildfires in California, and the audience question here is, are you also considering solar degradation due to wildfire smoke and ash accumulating on the panels? Wondering if anyone can speak to that, maybe Alex or Sharif or, yeah. of course, Michael feels like he's coming. Yeah, one thing I do want to comment on, uh, and maybe Sharif can talk, comment on the, the degradation, but one thing we, we do with smart tracking is diffuse tracking, right? Um, unfortunately, as I'm a resident of California, we've been devastated with, with the wildfires this season and, the, and obviously the past four previous seasons. So within that, when you have such a large amount of solar in California that might be sort of behind this large amount of smoke, we can actually change our tracking angle to adapt to it if it's very smoky out and still produce well. Um, and then beyond that, you know, when you think about a, a risk profile, luckily we have not had any wildfire issues ourselves. I think typically solar is, you know, located in areas outside of trees, you know, sort of in the desert, uh, if you will. But we do need to react to the conditions um, that wildfires produce most pre predominantly smoke, right? I don't know if Sharif, if you had any comments on, on the overall degradation. Yeah, no, that's, that's great. And absolutely. I mean, there was, there will definitely be an impact on the performance and the energy produced by the, by the plant as the modules get soiled. However, it is a recoverable degradation um, as opposed to an impact, a hail impact that will damage the module and will not be able to recover. And so from that perspective, it's an O&M issue that the, the developers and the O&M teams can react to um, once once this, the the event passes and and they can they can clean and maintain the systems um, and continue operating and recover those losses. Okay, great, appreciate you chiming in, um, both of you. And it looks like we're actually at time. So Alex, I'll pass things over to you to wrap it up. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, I just want to thank everyone for, for joining. It was really exciting to see the overall audience. We had module manufacturers. We had asset managers. We had owners. We, you know, we even had tracker competitors, which I welcome to this conversation as well. And ultimately, again, this is really becoming an industry thing, right? Um, we have owners calling us every day to try to protect our insurance, try to protect our assets, try to produce power. And the more we can advance our industry, the more we can have smarter trackers and, war and, and get rid of these risks that we're all discussing about, these risks that are becoming an every year risk, right? Every year the storms get crazier, and that means every year the insurance is going up, and every year it becomes a greater threat to solar. So the more we can get smarter, the more we can get connected, we can bridge solar to be that, that big energy producer that we all want it to be. And so I thank everyone for being here. I thank, you know, uh, Green Tech Media for, for, for putting on this, and I hope we can continue, to continue this conversation over time. Thank you.